Hey everyone, welcome to the Wild and Uncut podcast brought to you by Ruger. I'm your host, Christy Titus. Thank you for tuning in. The line is going hot, so let's go full send on this episode. If we just tell everybody that we come into contact with, be attentive to everything. They will stop very quickly being attentive to anything (laughs) because it's too much. Most crime happens at three feet in distance in in three seconds. Why is it that we have to, if you believe Hollywood, take on a victim mentality where you have to call somebody for help? Help, we're very lucky. Help will arrive as fast as it can most of the time. But will it get there in time? <laughs> All right. a can of worms. We ain't got time like that, Christy. We don't have enough time for everything we're going to talk about today on Wild and Uncut. Thank you guys so much for joining me. I, we, I'm here at the Well-Armed Woman Chapter Leadership Conference with my good friend Morgan Mills. Hello, hello. And we have, we're going to go into the dirt today, literally, <laughs> oh, <like> that. Nice. <laughs> with like Terry that. Vaughn, who is here teaching us about dangerous dangerous individual individual recognition training yes dirt we're going in the dirt in the dirt i love it yeah and i just don't let him look you in the (laughs) eyes when you first meet him because i don't want to say he's a body language expert because he doesn't really like that but that's really what he is and he assessed me in a and he's like you are probably a psychopath within five minutes and i was like you're right this you're right it's great no i said you were a people pleaser I was we, we got to the bottom of that very quickly same thing as psychopath it's almost the same <laughs> <laughs> and then morgan's like um can i spend all day with him because i want to go into psychology and i need to have him i've got to listen to all of this stuff and oh yeah up. you're like all in so we're all here because i mean I'm fascinated with you. Morgan's fascinated with you. And I really think the audience is going to be fascinated with you and everything that you have to share. Um, I mean, it's been, I, I tried to, I tried to stay for your seminar today. And unfortunately I was remiss to, to having, uh, to leave. Um, Judy called, you had to go. Yeah. It was a yeah. bummer. So I missed a lot. Yeah. It was a good session. Now, the thing is, this is especially for a group like this. They not only want, They need the information. So they're very receptive. They want to explore different ways of decoding the people they come into contact with, decoding the people they don't come into contact with, but perhaps are in the periphery of their environment. Your ability to just quickly assess is one of those just golden skills that you can then enter an environment and reasonably confidently say, okay, you know, this person I may want to keep a little bit of an eye on, but everybody else seems fairly good. Mm -hmm. I mean, that alone is enough to, you know, be able to take your 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 anxiety down a little bit because we never want to turn off we don't want to ever stop scanning but we want to modulate it depending on the environment and your ability to go into somewhere and read some people and go okay this is what i think and then know yes you got it right it's it's good you can kind of play then with how attentive you need to be at any given time so the nra has a curriculum called refuse to be a victim and i'm certified to teach that curriculum and it's more of like awareness of of objects and preparing your home and there is some mental aspect of it but what what you're training is not just how to protect your environment you put yourself in but to protect yourself with situational awareness but that's such a broad term as I'm learning today yeah, very what, broad. what does situational awareness even mean like oh yeah I'm aware <coughs> that we're in a room right now and wow yeah but you've made it more of like defining than that Yes, you have to be you have to be able to look at the entire subject in its component parts. If you take a generalized view of situational awareness and say, Well, I'm just gonna be attentive, but don't say to what, you've given your brain an impossible task. What's it gonna look at? Everything? You can't possibly. I mean we have a very limited amount of cognitive horsepower available to us at any given time anyway. So if we're consciously assessing everywhere we go, what happens for most people is they get so bloody tired of that that they stop doing it. Yeah. Whereas what we need to do is to find a way to work and lean into our strengths. And what's our strength? That's our subconscious mind picking up the slack. If you teach your subconscious how to 
evaluate and assess in these section, these separate parts, it becomes easier. Mm -hmm. Because it's like autopilot, you know, when you drive. We don't think about driving anymore, you know, unless something happens, of course. Most of the time, it, it just happens automatically. Well, we want assessing and scanning to be much the same because then it's not so much of a, a chore. If we just tell everybody that we come into contact with, be attentive to everything. They will stop very quickly being attentive to anything <laughs> because mm -hmm. it's too much. Mm -hmm. So do you have some main things that, like, our listeners, c our audience can say, okay, I'm supposed to pay attention to th things, but what are like those number one, two, three bad things? Well, specific environments come with more inherent risk than others. And I, you know, I hate to generalize in this way, but it, unfortunately it's true. Any, any type of parking lot, any type of gas station, those are two environments that we should take our attention to what's happening up. Predominantly because they're transient in nature. People are always coming and going. We don't know who's supposed to be there, who's mm -hmm. not supposed to be there. So it's much easier to get a baseline reading on the environment. So a big component to my pay attention to things is, okay, well, let's at least select where do we need to be attentive or more attentive than perhaps we, we are in other areas. And then how do you feel about it? And it's odd to add, to go into it with a let's get in tune with our feelings kind of approach for a former you know British British military guy, but we miss a lot by not allowing those types of emotional responses to an environment guide how we respond to what's going on around us. And yet our subconscious is already scanning in many ways to keep us in one piece. So if we enter an environment, let's say you having for whatever reason to fill up late at a gas station and you pull in and you're about to get out of the car, but you get an uneasy feeling, but consciously and what you can actually see, there's nothing there. So what do we normally do with an instinctive response that said something might not be right, but we're not sure. I, I got to get gas. I'm going to do it. You know, and you get out and you go through the motions. You override the instinctive response to be cautious. That's human nature. And then something bad happens. And of course, you know, things like, uh, have you guys heard of pareidolia? Okay, no. that's, it's essentially an evolutionary trait where we, we see shapes, faces amongst them in inanimate objects and the reason we, that we do that is because evolutionarily speaking we needed to identify we were in the presence of someone that might be stalking us mm -hmm. so a good example would be you might see a group of leaves happens to be grouped together that looks a bit like a face and you can't help but you you suddenly find yourself visually drawn to the face in the trees and you laugh because it, well, it's not really a face but it looks like a face well your subconscious was responsible for that response yeah. it wanted to draw your attention to it so you, let's say you're back in the gas station again it's nine o'clock your subconscious notices face-like features in the shrubbery near the gas station but consciously you didn't see it but your subconscious goes that's not good there's a guy literally hiding in a bush yeah. well you get that gut feeling but consciously you're scanning and there doesn't seem to be anything Abnormal. Consciously, yes. So you override it. Well, one of my big things is listen to those instinctive responses because your subconscious only wants to keep you in one piece. Mm -hmm. If you are listening and you go, okay, something definitely is amiss. Even if you can't identify it, is it necessary to get out of your vehicle at that particular juncture? Because if it's not, and I, and I mean important enough that your life might depend on it, yeah. Whoosh, well, let's hightail it out and go somewhere else or do it another time. Mm-hmm. But yes, there's a component of getting in touch with those feelings. But I think when most people understand, okay, well, there's a, there's a real science-based reason for why I might be uncomfortable, we're more likely to listen. It's when we don't know where that feeling originated, we override it. We yeah. just ignore it. Did you, the whole theory you were just talking about, about noticing faces and in and, and shrubberies and trees and stuff, did you put that on your social media? Where you put yes, different pictures? Yes, I did. I was I like, I have Paridonia. heard about this before. <laughs> Wait a minute. It was at 2 a.m. in my bedroom on his Instagram. <laughs> and her it right was, brain just went, remembered it. You it went through uh, pictures of TikTok. trees. And, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, I'm so glad you watched it. That's fantastic. Yes. Because as you were talking about it, I was like, yes, I've seen that very recently. <laughs> this is really like, hitting very, home. Very, <laughs> very recently. Very <laughs> recently. That's brilliant. Yes, that's one of that's one of those instances. But, but I love right. that as an example. You did something great. You had it. The picture's going really fast. Mm -hmm. Three seconds is what you gave the example for today, correct? Uh, for which part? When you did the people interacting with each other. 
are they singing or oh, are they yes, arguing? Oh, yes, the test, the three-second test. You gave a three-second test. And yes. is that, I mean, cognitively, three seconds, I mean, we evaluate a situation or a body language or things. I mean, mm-hmm. it was very quick. And so is there is there something that, you know, you can train your brain with rapid training or is that just Absolutely. coincidence? No, or just practice. Okay. Our, our brains and the neuroscience of connections, not necessarily making new connections because after age 25, we don't necessarily make new neural connections. We re- rewrite older ones. Now, if you're you know, less than 25 approximately, then yes, you'll be making new neural connections. That's why for most people, the schooling, you know, finishes at age 24, 25. But three seconds, you can train yourself. You can train yourself to do it even faster than that. Okay. But it does take practice. But literally anyone can do it. It's just that we don't take the time. Most people are so busy. The last thing they want to add is one more thing they're trying to accomplish in a day. But it's fast. If you did want to practice, follow him on TikTok. Because yes. when those when you did that video and those images were going by fast, mm-hmm. my I didn't even have to think about it. My body, my eyes, my mind naturally said, there's the face, there's the face, there's the face. And there were a couple that I missed, and I was upset with myself. <laughs> Right. So then I watched it again. And you got it for you because you get more views (laughs) on your. I'm not hating. That's the whole point of it is you're supposed to you're supposed to watch Mm -hmm. it. You're smarter than the average bug. (laughs) Yeah, I watched it. I watched it a few times. I was like, okay, I want to do this until I get all the faces. But it's practicing, right? I was by doing that, I was training my mind to be able to see those faces in the images. Yeah, and when when we start talking about time. You know, there's, there, there are things called micro expressions, and that's where, you know, a facial expression is exhibited for a very short period of time. And by very short, I mean 1 25th of a second, perhaps less. Those expressions happen very quickly, but the reason they happen is because the internally there's a strong emotional response to circumstances, whatever that may be, whether it's an interaction or, you know, environmentally. But the person, for whatever reason, needs to hide that emotion. So they're immediately trying to shut it down. So there's this flash that occurs and before you necessarily can see it they're already trying to shut it down we know the emotions occurring so they're trying to mask it or control it well those face those facial expressions micro expressions are very quick they're also i wouldn't say completely unusual they're a little bit outside of the norm you're more likely and you would be better off in learning to recognize subtle facial expressions because people don't necessarily always have to try to control their their face in the same way that they they if they show you fear or sadness that let's say in a therapy session you know they're trying to get out of hospital which is where micro expression training began with paul ekman way back in the day was because they had people on suicide watch at hospitals that wanted to get out of the hospital so they were trying very hard to Exhibit a certain Exhibit a behavior. Certain, exactly. So that they could get away. Well, one person that they did let out because they thought she was fine did ultimately commit suicide. So they went back and looked at the video footage and they slowed it down. And I, from what I understand, Paul Ekman literally went through frame at a time and then went, it's right there. A, a strong emotional expression of sadness when she said she was fine. So that's where you know, the micro expression started. began. Yes. Mm-hmm. So, but there's not very many off, not very many situations that we would find ourselves in where somebody has to absolutely shut it down. Like there's a reason for them to hide that emotion. But we, so what we're more, what we see more often, subtle people. They have that little bit of that emotion, whatever it may be, and they don't necessarily want you to know that they're feeling that way. But it's there nonetheless. So those small su- expressions. I think are really valuable micro expressions you can train yourself but unless it's an in if you have a role as an investigator or something well maybe you want to put more time into micro expression training because then you might see a situation where someone has to try and control their emotional Mm -hmm. displays but for most of us teenagers or teenagers you might want to get micro expression training so you can look at your kids and be like (laughs) <laughs> Are you lying? I know you're lying. I can tell. You just twitched your eyeball. Your poor kids. And that always means every time you're lying, you can't lie to me. Your kids I'm your can't mom. get away with anything, I have Terry. no kids. Yeah, no, his Terry, kids. No. Oh, they can't get away with anything. And his kids know where every exit is in every room. And yeah, they, they have do. like three escape plans on what ifs. Do you play the what if game? Oh, all the time. So the what if game, I've just, this is a new horizon for me. So mm-hmm. give me a moment. Uh, yeah, yeah. You walk into a room, and, and we talk about situational awareness. We talk about reading body language. These are all really important things. 
you can play this game all the time. All the time with everybody. With everyone. So you walk in and you look at people and you're like, ooh, he's got to go to the bathroom because he's shaking his leg or, <laughs> you know, or, um, you know, he's in a hurry. He's trying to get out of the room or, and just mm-hmm. start reading what people are telling you without talking. But the other thing that will also protect you is where are the exits? Where what did what did you call that a dark wall earlier with no ends or something? I can't remember what? the description. Like I don't there's that. a wall if you can't see beyond it. Oh, and a, what did oh, you dead call? zones? Dead zone. I'm like dead zones. And well, I was focusing on this. I'm like yeah. that dead zone right there. Dead That's zone. why I said dark wall. Mm-hmm. So I, I in my mind I learned the wrong thing. Um, but <laughs> dead zones. I mean, so uh, there's these things that we can practice. These games that will what if games that keep us safe. Okay. Well, I walk into a room. Let's assess where what what first people or environmental conditions. Environment first, then people. Environment is always a factor. People are not. So in, in the instance of walking into a room, you don't want to walk into a room, a building, or any facility that you don't already know how to get out of. Do you remember, did you ever guys watch, I think it was Ronan. It yeah, was with Robert De Niro. Familiar. Okay, so, you know, he was supposed to be a spy and all that stuff. And for years, I would say to my clients, when I was teaching them how to stay safe. I said, you don't ever walk into a building you don't know how to walk out of. And in the movie... Ronan, he goes to this guy, he goes and puts a gun behind the back of the building and then he goes in for this secretive meeting. And the woman who owns the bar that they're meeting in comes, follows him out and says, what were you doing back here? And he says, lady, I don't ever walk into a building I don't know how to walk out of. And he'd hidden his gun somewhere. So if he got patted down, it was just, I'm like, oh, I've been saying that for years. Someone's been reading your mail. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. Somebody like, saw one of your how seminars. How did this happen? <laughs> I mean, high brilliant. level stalker. Uh-huh. High level, very high level. High level. But yeah, that's just one of the things. It's it's walking into any environment and first assessing the environment, then in, including the people in it, and then, okay, you read it from there. But we always want to take stock of the environment first because that's always going to be a factor, and people and threats are not always. We don't want to d- you know, discount them, but the environment always is. And any area you can't see around or through is a dead zone potentially because that's where, you know, Muppets like to hide and jump out and do bad things. Mm -hmm. Muppets. Got to watch out for them (laughs) Muppets. Actually, they are kind of terrifying when you're a kid. (laughs) I'm not going to lie. They are. um, So beyond situational awareness, having those focal points, assessing humans, paying attention to body language, is there any, from that psychological standpoint, specific nervous behaviors that people exhibit when they're up to no good? That's that's a that's yeah. a common trait. Yeah, because what happens often when people are working up, and it depends on how seasoned the criminal is as to how stressed they might be before they commit the crime. Because there are a lot of seasoned professional criminals that out there that uh, don't care. That they just don't care. But there are those that you know they might be under the influence of, and you can fill in the blanks there, and or not exactly practiced. You know, it may be one of those spontaneous type crimes that they're thinking of doing, but they're not really sure. And the moment they get that ad- adrenal d- dump and the, the autonomic system starts to you know play up, well, now we, we're, we're likely to see behaviors that are directly influenced by the adrenaline that that person's feeling. So you might see, and this is a, Joe Navarro, who's an FBI profiler, coined this, it's MAP, Manipulator Adaptive pa- Pacifiers. Behaviors that you can see that are a a direct result of someone trying to self-soothe. They're trying to do something to calm themselves and downplay the anxiety they might feel right before the crime. Mm -hmm. So as you saw during my presentation where a variety of different crimes occurred, various behaviors, rocking, self-soothing, hands stroking, touching, you know, the the things that sometimes you... When a woman's anxious, she might see her, you know, twiddling with her hair, or you know, so a necklace up here. Those are behaviors directly linked to that anxiety and the chemicals that are going off in the body. So I have a list here <laughs> from your <laughs> class. She took notes. Yeah, no, he. I just took a picture of his uh, predatory uh-huh. signals, words if they're ranting, sweating, yes. agitation, tapping, fidgeting, sudden stillness. Changes in distance. Actually, the sudden stillness I, I particularly like because if somebody is exhibiting a certain behavior and you can you can co- correlate that to potential, potentially nefarious behavior or it's coming down the pipe, something's on the way to you, when that behavior suddenly stops, those chemicals haven't necessarily dissipated. Because the chemicals in the body, they have a shelf life. So it isn't that they're, not, they're no longer feeling the anxiety. It's that they've reached that point where now those chemicals are pressure building you know, like a steam cooker. And when they reach 
the a tipping point, point, exactly, they're in and then we go. So if you see someone that's exhibiting some sort of nervous traits, sweating, you know, pacing, stuff that's that, that manipulator adapt to pacifier behavior, when they suddenly stop doing that, either it's over and they've decided no, or it's on, like Donkey Kong. Because it, it's at that point, they're likely to, okay, now I'm going for it. Like it's on. And it's amazing to see that transition as that decision is made. Okay, now it's on. Now I need all that energy to go and perpetrate the crime, whatever that may be. So Makes perfect stopping sense. like that sort of internalizes all yeah. those chemicals and suddenly, boom, now they got to go. Yeah. So one thing I want to talk about with the audience is not just that you're a body language leader, is you were a former British Royal Marine Commando in an elite branch of Her Majesty's Royal Navy and you've got a lot of training and and you're not just studying psychology and body language like you're full military you have a you have a uh, martial arts background you can mm-hmm. kind of tell more about that but what what you said something earlier today you said the best fight you can get into is the one you don't start, right? <laughs> Something like that. The like, only one you can guarantee you, winning is the one you don't, you don't start. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. So um, I'm like, okay, this makes sense. So, you know, don't put yourself in a situation where, you know, you mm. <laughs> can't get out of it. Um, there's, I think there's a lot of times when and maybe more so males than females. So mm-hmm. there, there are plenty of women out there that, you know, get a little stroppy. It's, it's an ego driven thing. They want to prove a point. Yeah. And, and, Unfortunately, you don't know who you're going to prove that point to. Yeah. You know, and I, I've been very fortunate. I've got to meet a number of really hard ass guys and gals. Yeah. And one of the consistent themes with the ones that I found myself drawn to and and liking was ego. Ego was not a factor. Yeah. Chris Kyle, I got to spend time with him, mm-hmm. an American sniper. He was the nicest, most down to earth, quick to laugh guy. One of them that I've ever met. And, and arguably one of the most dangerous in American history. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't know that. Mm-mm. And we got to hang out at SHOT Show not too long before he was murdered. But hanging out with him for this very short period of time, he was quick to laugh. And there was nothing about any anything in his behavior that would tell you, oh, yeah, this is a guy who's absolutely as dangerous as they come. Nothing. Mm-hmm. Nothing at all. Very down to earth. I got to spar with Shane Carwin former UFC heavyweight champion, MMA. The guy's a monster. He's relaxed, Mm -hmm. laid back, Mm non-ego driven. Again, one of the toughest people you could probably meet. The the consistent theme here is smart enough to keep their ego in check and know it can happen to anyone at any time. And I've always been a big proponent with the stuff that I used to teach when I was a bit younger in that it's much better to avoid that conflict if you can than to get mixed up in something because you don't know who you're going up against. You like to think, oh, I've done a bit of training and I, you know, I've got it going on. But the reality is that other person may be better trained, more agile, stronger, faster. You know, you run the gamut and they, they might win or they might just get a lucky punch mm-hmm. or a lucky anything. Mm-hmm. It hurts just as much. So, yes, I always, when I was teaching how to defend yourself in a variety of ways it was always or you can be smart enough to read your environment and the people in it to avoid it because that's the one you can walk away safely from so this leads me into the inner warrior conversation Mm -hmm. that you were having like i'm gonna i i think i'm tough right like i was raised on a farm i had mules they're they're hard-headed you know and I'm a hunter, so I'm always top of the food chain, right? And mm-hmm. I, I think that I'm tough, you know, and I'm like, I'm so tough and whatever. And I did a, a firearms training school, uh, Real World Tactical with Tony Sentiment, where throughout the day, they started us out with basic pistol drills, and then we'd lay on our back and shoot upside down. And then they taught us how to shoot around barricades and how to maneuver around cars and shoot through windshields. And then... In the afternoon, and mind you, it's in Miami. It's uh, 90 degrees and 100% humidity, so it's hot. Sounds like a great class, though. Well, it gets worse. So you're outside (laughs) all day long. Oh, I'd die. And then they're like, okay, uh, we're doing some CrossFit drills, basically. So you do Mm -hmm. CrossFit drill, go shoot, and apply those same things you learn in the morning. Another CrossFit drill, go shoot. Another CrossFit drill, go shoot. People are puking. Then Mm -hmm. they bring in experts like you that fight. And one guy is 
standing and one guy has people on the ground mm-hmm. and I watched the other girl there was another girl in the class and they mm-hmm. were just kind of tossing her just hit her in her in the arm and and you know just getting her to fight right Creating create stress. a create a fight response mm-hmm. so I'm like oh yeah these guys are <laughs> they're going like on her <laughs> dude I stepped oh. up to this dude I went toe to toe and he looked at my cameraman and he's like flattens me out throws me into a cornfield or something i don't even know i mean ass ends me like bonk, gone and i came up and i don't i was mad good <laughs> i came up and i tried to punch this man and instead of punching me in the arm like mm-hmm. he was the girl he was gloving my face oh uh-huh. and just bouncing it off my chin and every time he'd bounce it off my chin i was coming at it and i was trying to hit him with every breath of every bit of anything I had in my body, I was trying to hit this man and I could not hit him. Mm-hmm. Not once did I land a punch. And then one punch, he hit me in my stomach, it, right in the ribs. I've never had pain. Like, and he didn't even hit me hard. I was like, oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. Like, what just happened? Like, I was powerless. Then I get on the ground with this dude and he is literally just bee slapping me. Beep, beep. And I'm like, mm, like a baby. <laughs> Help, ah, make it stop. Tyrannosaurus <laughs> arms. Ah. You know, I, then they, and I can't remember if it was one minute or two minute for each cycle. And then you jump up and Tony's screaming at you the whole time. Keep fighting. You're going to effing die. Don't stop. Your life's here. You know, and he's screaming at you and you're like, oh, and there's people vomiting. Lord, you know? take me <laughs> now. <laughs> and then once you're done with this, you have to go shoot your gun. Yeah. Oh, jeez. Literally. How well do you perform? And it's called the total exhaustion and fatigue drill, which they build you up to it all day, mm-hmm. mentally, physically. And they want you where you're just going to lay there and die. But that's the point is you have to get through that and not lay there and die. So when you were talking earlier about um, the inner warrior Mm -hmm. and all of these women were all like, Oh, I'm mama bear. I'm going to do this. And and I, (laughs) I am like, I'm mama bear. And when you, when you said who'd raise their hand, you're that person. I held back for a second. I was like, Hmm. I I don't, I mean, I might think that I could do that. Mm-hmm. Physically, could I? Mm-hmm. I mean, the the whole point of a firearm is it's an equalizer, right? Like, Correct. we're small people, and yep. we may think we're strong and tough. Yeah. But until you're in that situation, and even in a training situation like that, I walked away from that class, and I was like, man, my inner warrior got a big <laughs> kick in the crotch. Mm-hmm. Because I went from being like, man, I could take on a fight, to, mm, I better stay away from I mean, there's yes. a lot of fights I can't win, yep. and and it was very humbling to me and made me really realize the importance of being smart, being prepared, but also knowing when to fold them. Like, y- you know, you've got to not be um, so overly confident to where you are going to just step out of the car at the gas station, even though you know some weird dudes over there. Yep. Like, be humble. I think that's what differentiates your training, Terry, from a lot of training that the women at the well-armed women shooters in general um, go through. We go through these drills where it's reactive. Mm -hmm. We are reactive to a lot of things. And what you're teaching, a lot of what you're teaching is proactive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The vast majority is proactive. And so we're avoiding getting in that situation Situation to begin with. And that's why it's so important because Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that is what we're taught. The first thing is avoid it. Like you avoid said, it. somebody wants to take your wallet, give them the wallet. Mm-hmm. We were told that since day one. And don't pick a fight you don't need to. But more than that, it's just situational awareness so we don't get in the situation where we have to ever use our yep. firearm for anything other than shooting sports. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, the thing is for a lot of people, they didn't, they've never tested themselves like that. They've yeah. never been pushed to the point where their physical and emotional fatigue is so pronounced they, they, there's a contemplation period in there where you're like, it's just easier if I stop. If I just give up, you don't ever give up. While there's breath in your body, you fight. You fight. But unless you've been in that situation, there's no stop. A lot of people, they, they've never put themselves in that situation. Why classes like the one you went to are so fantastic. Well, because I mean, they for someone like me, yeah. I mean, I am, I'm, I'm a predator. 
Like I have never, I, and I won't mm-hmm. even watch horror movies. And this is the God's honest truth because to be in the mindset of a victim freaks me yeah, it's out. Mm. I will not watch yeah. horror movies if if I I have to sit and watch somebody be victimized on a TV show and like a horror type movie. Uh uh-uh, uh, I'm not doing it. I'm not. I don't want that in my brain. Yeah, but I look at the mentality of Hollywood in general when it comes to horror movies. Everybody's a victim. What well, the first thing that happens in any horror movies, you end up with somebody running around screaming, saying mm-hmm. "Help me!" Mm-hmm. Like some mystical, magical person is going to show up and help you because you must seek help. You can't possibly do this by yourself. A well-armed, well-trained individual, female or male, who was carrying and prepared, first of all, probably wouldn't have ended up in that bloody stupid situation in the first place. But secondly, if it did happen, and of course, bad things happen to good people all the time. If it does happen, I'm sorry, what were you saying as you draw your gun and get into a good defensive position or your... It's over. The, yeah. the movie's, you know, 35 seconds long, and then we're all gra- <laughs> going to the bathroom and calling it a night. We, Hollywood believes that we are not capable, and that, to me, speaks to the mindset they think we should all have, a victim mentality, that, and I can't stand I it. I was talking about this earlier, too, and this is what really gets me with people that are anti-Second Amendment, anti, anti-gun, anti mm-hmm. because the elitists have armed, armed security. security. Well, their defense of that <laughs> is always, well, they're trained. Everybody Excuse can get me. trained. I am I not capable yes. of being trained? So now mm-hmm. you're telling me mm. yes. because you're an elite, whatever mindset you have, that you get to have protection because you have trained protection, yeah. but I'm not capable of becoming trained and I'm too stupid or it's be Oh no, no. I mean this we are capable individuals mm-hmm. and um we are as capable as any trained person the only difference is training. Yes, that's it. Get the training. That's right. And now walk confidently around in your world. Mm-hmm. But no if you can avoid it that's your best course of action. But if it finds you on the day for whatever reason you weren't as aware and or it was a cons- Firing of circumstances that caught you in that position. Well, okay, I, I've got me a backup plan, and I'm going to level the playing field right now. So now you're the five foot three inch, hundred and twenty five pound female can go toe to toe with a six foot two. No, you no, know, no. And any other world, no. But when you have your firearm and you've had training and you're ready mentally and emotionally, physically, okay. Was that this is a non-starter and you are going to lose if you're the bad guy and that's what we want why why is it that we have to if you believe hollywood yeah. take on a victim mentality where you have to call somebody for help mm-hmm. help we're very lucky help will arrive as fast as it can most of the time but will it get there in time mm-hmm. yeah probably not yeah. probably not most crime happens at three feet in distance in, in three seconds. is yeah. You'll know the stats better than me. I blink my eyes twice and it, it's over. I mean, you're mm-hmm. it, it happens so quickly. And that's why I think it's so valuable for the audience to really take away a lot of what you're saying um, is just not putting yourself there in the first place. As much as possible. I, I'm a big advocate to live your life. I mean, I train and teach a lot of women's groups in different capacities from realtors to nurses and you've got to live a life you you've got a business to run or you have to go to the hospital at weird shift hours you have a life you should live that life but live it empowered with the knowledge that if you've been trained and, and know what to look for you can do just that without ever necessarily having to feel the fear and stress of, okay, well, it's late at night. I don't know what I'm looking for. What if it happens tonight? And now you've gone down the wrong track. You've mm-hmm. gone down that, that sort of victim mindset where the anxiety is detrimental to the primary objective of being alert in the first place. Yeah, yeah. So a big component to everything that I do with DIRT is about empowering you with the skills needed to live your life. Do your, 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 you do you, right? Your, your career, your life, whatever, but do it from a position of power or being empowered. Not no. in a state of fear. No, no, no. Don't live in fear. Yeah. I hate that. Yeah, that's important. And I was actually going to ask you that because you are obviously, you've trained more than all of us in regards to this. Um, when do you, do you ever shut off or feel defenseless? And when is that? He's if, sleeping. 
That's yeah, when he shut it. off. He's sleeping. You don't have a moment sleep. when you're at home and maybe like on the couch with your like. It's so funny. Never do you does it ever because I wonder and I ask this for a reason. Yes. There is scientifically, and you probably don't have any more because you're so trained. But I wonder if there's a, a release of cortisol that happens that you're you're just. And it's maybe not a fear thing. I just wonder if biologically, like, always being on can affect you in other ways that, that you've noticed, maybe? When I'm at home, I'm as relaxed as I'm ever going to get. And okay. yes, I want to be relaxed at home. So I'm not nearly as on as I am when I leave the house, but it's never off. But I think what happens is you get used to a certain level. And it's I, I equate being alert to an old-style thermostat. It's one of those old ones with the beveled edges that you can feel. And you can you can dial down how alert and in tune you are. And then in certain environments, we dial in it up and we dial it down. It's something that I think it's very visually easy and cognitively easy for people to visualize mm-hmm. this modulation. When I'm at home, I'm nearly all the way down, but it's never off. off. Got it. When I go out, I dial it up 10, 20 degrees. You know, I get to a certain environment, I'm going up another 10 degrees in terms of awareness. It's a good way to look at it. And But it just allows you to modulate it. Because I think when we enter into a mindset of being constantly on edge, again, it becomes too fatiguing. Those cortisol, the stress, again, it's detrimental. We want to have a life and, yeah. and live it and do it to the best of our abilities, as happy as we can. But we're never off. You never turn that thermostat down to and shut it down. I... I don't and I don't know many people I think who've had similar experiences military law enforcement emergency first responders those kinds of people I don't think it's ever really off it just it gets turned down and when women come through and do classes or sessions like this for well-armed women it just shows them a different way to assess without having to you know get down that path of anxiety and stress I wonder if you even turn it off when you sleep Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I'm afraid everybody's pretty much defenseless when they sleep. I mean, there's certain times when you know, a noise outside of the expected, your brain will go, OK, something's up yeah. and you're immediately, you know, you come awake. Mm-hmm. But that that's one of the things. That's why trust is a sliding scale. And yeah. I mean this in, in the broadest sense possible. You know, when you trust someone, if you could sleep in their presence and know you're safe, mm-hmm. if you cannot you do not trust yeah because that's really what it all boils down to is our ability to be defenseless in the presence of others and know that we are safe that they will watch over us as we would watch over them which is what we used to do back in the day as hunter gatherers yeah but but if you know so that's my that's always my sliding scale if i won't fall asleep in your presence i don't really trust you now if i will it means i trust you completely because it's all or nothing i'm defenseless I'm not defenseless. You know, you're either on or off. Yeah. It's just cool. it's a different way of looking at it, I suppose. Yeah, no, I like that. No, that's really great. Um, and it and it goes it goes to show you, like, who's in the circle. How close do you let them in the circle? There's people you don't let in your home. Correct. There's people that you won't be alone in a car with. Yep. There's people <laughs> that you won't sit by at a convention. Yes. Um, I mean, there's, like, okay, I'm in the room with that person. That's fine. But I'm not getting in the elevator with them. You know, I mean, yes. there's different levels of trust and we have to really pay attention to those levels of trust because there's a reason behind mm-hmm. it with we may not cognitively yeah. recognize totally. that. Correct. Reasoning. Absolutely. Um, and we, that's a great way of looking at it, isn't it? Yeah. You're like, OK, I trust you this far, but I won't trust you that far. Yeah. And we do this with people all the time. We just don't necessarily assign a value to it. Mm-hmm. But we do go through our life and form our friendships and relationships based on that level of trust without necessarily, you know, cognitively considering it. But we do we have this sliding scale. Yeah. Yeah. We were just talking about that, how I was learning about this, the theory of it's called the um, uh, circle boundary theory, mm-hmm. where essentially it looks, the visual is like a bullseye. So you have the bullseye and then the target with the different, you know, circles. Moving that out come concentrically. Out. Yeah. And it's like in the center of the circle is like who you trust the most. Yes. Right. And so like if it, God would be right. It's like God mm-hmm. and, and your dog, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and like not many people there. And then the circle, the outer circle is like the people that you, you can trust r- as much as you can. Mm hmm. But, you know, when you're really analyzing what that means, the further you go out, it's like, you know what, some family 
that should be mm-hmm. in an inner circle is is maybe in an outer, outer. circle. Mm-hmm. Can I tell this person something they're not going to tell anyone else? Uh huh. They've proven that in the past they can't. That's so more even intimacy. We, like how intimate can I be emotionally yes. with that person? How yeah. vulnerable. Vulnerable. Yeah. Maybe mm-hmm. that's a better way to you put hold, it. Yeah. You hold back yeah. on certain things and yeah. not talk about others. Yeah. But yeah, it doesn't. It's amazing who ends up in which circle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Pretty so people, you're launching like this whole, and I'm, I can I'm registering like. <laughs> <laughs> You're registering. I'm registering. You're launching this whole dirt training yeah. digitally online, and you yep. have some components of it up right now. So, what They've do you have started. live right now? Yeah. So, the, just the first part of dirt, a little bit towards the baseline. Whenever we're trying to read somebody, if we want to do it properly, we're going to employ principles to decoding, which is baseline context and clusters. Baseline behavior, what's normal for that person in this environment with these people with these emotions present? We can't do that necessarily in a personal safety setting for baseline because we may not have time. Mm -hmm. You know, we would like to, that'd be great. But the reality is no. So now we want to baseline the environment and we contextualize behaviors that fit or don't fit that environment. What's what I like to refer to is either above or below baseline. What's normal in this environment? In the context may be a factor. We're sitting in a well-lit room. It's it's great. You know, we know now we head back to our car. Let's say it's late in the evening. Well, we know low light and dark. That's predator time. So, we, you know, our, our awareness may change a little bit. So baseline and context, the circumstances we find ourselves in. And then clusters, if we're able to, we want to find groups of relational signals when they relate to one another, we're more likely to be accurate in our deductions. Mm-hmm. Well, from a personal safety standpoint, you may only get one signal. So now we have to play that back into context. Well, what's the environment that we're in? Is it okay that that person's loitering in this location at this time of night outside your home or checking that, you know, it means there's obvious times when we're like, no, this just doesn't fit. If you, that's what I've started with, and I'm going to lead into all the other body language and the mindset and the strategy, but it's going to be. There will be a lot of information. My, my wife's getting mad at me because I'm like, I got 20 hours. But, Not yet. Like but right now, it's the first hour. But people can register and begin this this training and this awareness yes. right now. Oh wow! And and so that's really exciting. So your website, um, uh, what is your website? TV Empowers dot com and that that's where it will go we just launched for the well-armed women's national leadership conference and the page will go live so tv like television television just tv, TV no dots nope empowers empowers dot like com. terry dot com. terry vaughn terry yeah vaughn. so television same yep. thing um and uh I encourage all of you to look into this. And if nothing else, I think it will just help your perspective of we're always, and I've been on my phone today because I've been trying to go back and Mm -hmm. forth with information gathering and and (laughs) I have cliff notes for talking points. So I apologize if I seemed distracted, but as a general rule of thumb, we are extremely distracted by these things, these phones. Yeah. And, um, we're walking around with our head down and we're not paying attention and we're, we're walking into a parking garage FaceTiming and Snapchatting, and our kids are, and our, mm-hmm. I mean, uh, yeah, and and we extremely are vulnerable. extremely vulnerable, and we don't even realize that we take for granted um, this false sense of security that really isn't there. And I think your training for everyone is not only eye-opening. The women at this convention have eaten up everything you have to say because it is number one. We don't have to use our firearm to implement. Yeah. The things that you're talking about. This is a non-violent prevention. This is not, we aren't having to pick up a firearm and make that decision. Do I press the trigger or not? Mm-hmm. Or does my life depend on this moment? I mean, what, this is not this decision we're making here. Yeah. The decision we're making here is, am I going to pick up and open up my mind, pick up and open up my awareness and work on myself so that I can prevent becoming a victim and I I think that's why everyone in here is so empowered by it because it's something that we can all apply not only in an emergency situation like a training like Mm -hmm. I mean someone is really trying to hurt you or kill you this is an everyday life skill yeah it is we can apply well ahead of the the emergency is my hope Mm -hmm. that that your decision making assessment abilities general ability to walk into any environment read it decode it and and be at, eat at peace with it, it means that maybe the emergency never does happen. And that's great because the firearm, and I'm a huge proponent of carry whatever you're legally able to carry and will practice and train with, but that's a, that is a last resort. 
because in the real world, you're getting arrested. You're going to be in a in a big battle after the fight if you win. And so that's just the beginning. So there's a there's a machismo to it, I suppose. Well, I've got a gun. That's what I'll go to. Well, how's about you read the environment and the people in it well enough to not ever have to do that? Amen. That to me is that's the golden standard. Mm -hmm. I think if you end up in a gunfight. There are times, of course, where the circumstances conspire and it happens. It's beyond your control. It just does. But for the most part, there's probably a buttload of things you missed if you end up in a gunfight. You just weren't aware yeah. of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and that can be changed and anyone can change it. So for those, one of the things that I like to explore is those people that don't necessarily want to carry a gun. Well, what are they doing? That's mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's still it's still awareness. Mm -hmm. exactly the same thing so the principles still apply across the board i personally advocate to carry whatever you're comfortable carrying because it levels the playing field as you said earlier equalizer. and i love that mm -hmm. brilliant equalizer it is yeah. the equal it's the ultimate equalizer so the best place if you guys want to follow terry on social media is just to go to your website right yeah be because great. uh the handles obviously who knows where we're at with all of these things because nobody even has like real names anymore i mean you have a real name i have a real name but some people are like yeah, I'm athlete Barbie, forty-seven twenty-six. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, is that who? your handle? <laughs> no. And then you meet no. someone, you're like, I don't even know her name. That's yeah, who athlete is that? Barbie. Yeah. We know it's athlete. Like, no. What's her name? I don't know. Athlete Barbie. <laughs> Shouldn't have a name. It's Why funny. are we doing this? I don't know. I don't it? know. <laughs> I, I blame Gen Z. Oh <laughs> my gosh! No, like oh yeah. I mean, it literally, even in in, mm -hmm. in in the hunting industry, shooting industry, you don't know anybody's real name. You're like, you are your handle. You've just become yeah. this identity anyway. But if you want to know who he is, just go to his website, and then you can find him on all the social media yeah. channels. You're yeah. on TikTok. I'm not on TikTok, so I commend you for that. Oh, yeah. That's you fun. guys, he's yeah. a star on TikTok. Um, he has the best content and videos. Kudos to Thanks, you. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. And I'm that. sure your kids for teaching you all about TikTok. Oh, I, it would not have happened without them. They were <laughs> they were brilliant and instrumental. Like, let's do a few of these. And I was amazed at how Receptive quickly it took off. Were. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was funny. You were a good, good sport. This is actually a good place to, to, to end the podcast. We'll do something fun. Is on your on your TikTok. You know, TikTok's quick. You got a few seconds mm -hmm. to... Um, social media, I think a lot of people, they look at an influencer because they want to know how to dress. It's informational, right? Mm -hmm. They want to get information from you in whatever realm you're in. So your information, your little tidbits that you give are uh, one, a couple that I can think of right off the top of my head. How to spot three ways to spot if someone's lying to you. Oh, I need what to go. are the Look three ways? Oh, I don't think I did that video. You did? Because I did. I don't know. I'll have to look, I'll have to it look back at it. It was micro expressions. One was um, psychopath. How, two things that a psychopath does with their expressions. Oh, uh, their face. The yeah, habitual the face. central forehead contraction yes. in conjunction with smiling is often an indication of psychopathy simply because it's a, an amalgamation of two I have no idea what he just said. Wait, what did you just <laughs> what say? What language are <laughs> we talking now? Whoa. Okay, so. <laughs> Layman's terms. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> psychopaths they don't feel empathy through natural channels the way you and i would we're you know we're sharing stories i with have friends. the empathy line what are you talking about i Actually, get it that's a nose wrinkle that's a oh. rationalization empathy rapport <laughs> signal but we'll get to that another time <laughs> so <laughs> essential forehead contraction is indicative of emotional or physical pain and usually either felt by the person themselves or through an empathetic channel so someone that smiles and in addition, habitually shows a central forehead contraction where this central part of the frontalis muscle that's on the, on the top of the head contracts and lifts up. So you see this little pinch in the, in the forehead. That is an empathy expression or a emotional pain expression. So when we mix that habitually with smiling, those are two conflicting emotions on display oh, at the same time, that's which can indicate some level of psychopathy simply because they don't know which emotion they should be really feeling because they're not feeling real Anything. emotions. Exactly. So there's a correlation with that. But as far as the, the lying thing, there is no um, one signal that will that will tell you. And I think the one, the video you're referring to is the to blinking. Yes. There's a anxiety response. If somebody is 
let's say they're telling porky pies, right? And they're feeling stressed because of that. That's British for lies. It is porky they're pies. They're lying to you. I was like, let me just translate they saw over a here. porky pie. <laughs> what did they do with that? Were they, is that like an armadillo? <laughs> <laughs> If somebody's Sorry, feeling stress yes. because of the lie, you may see a change in the blink rate because what happens is cognitively that's causing emotional stress. And so the, eye, the, the blinking tends to come in these fluttery bursts or you might see a complete freeze in the blink as they try to force feed you what they're trying to sell you. Like look into my eyes. Look into my eyes because everybody <laughs> knows, well, if I'm going to tell a lie, I don't want to be shifty, which is an, actually an old wives tale. It, it, someone more likely if they're looking away from you they're telling you the truth rather than trying to force feed you the info but you what's most important in any of this is to baseline their behavior and look for deviations that go outside of what you would expect you're better off with that than just perhaps generalizing across the board and i do i think i know which video you're talking about now but yeah you're go all, to the TikTok. All, all of them are great and are you Thank putting you. these videos on instagram for um, people that are still middle-aged and not on tiktok <laughs> i did some yeah, but because i some had good yeah there. I, there's some there I, I i sort of stuck with tiktok when it took off and and was working well. I like that that platform, but I've tried to you know ferry stuff across mm-hmm. as well to Instagram, mm-hmm. and I probably should be doing more of mm-hmm. it. As with all social media and video content, it's time. It's, a, oh, it's yeah, so it's hard huge, to get it it's all in. Job. It's like a baby if you don't feed it. Yeah, it's gonna, it just it's dies. Gonna, yeah, I was going to not say that, yeah. but I, oh, sorry. I, was going <laughs> I should have I picked up on that. That's exactly <laughs> where I was going with it. I love it. You have to feed it like it's a machine. Like, yeah. you, you know, it you, really is. It's, yeah. So um, thank you so much. Like, seriously, Morgan and I could spend hours with you. I fantastic. cannot wait for the rest of your curriculum to launch and I hope our audience also is yeah. as energized and what you have to say is we are mm-hmm. um, because... You should be. Yeah, you should be, all of you. So yeah. thank you guys for joining us from The Well-Armed Woman. Again, thank you. your website is tvempowers.com and you can get online right now and do Terry's Dirt Training. Uh, we're Wild and Uncut. I hope you guys have enjoyed this podcast. From the Well-Armed Woman Conference, thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thank you for listening to the Wild and Uncut podcast. If you would like to hear more, be sure to subscribe to my Pursue the Wild digital series on YouTube and follow me at Christy Titus on Facebook and Instagram.